to entertain you today, as well as drink my body weight in water because I'm headed to the doctor to have some things checked out. And hopefully I'll be successful in both. (laughs) Although I may have to step out in about three minutes because suddenly I feel the urge to pee so much water. Paul Ihander, good morning with you on this Friday. Graham Hill is here on the ones and the twos. Speaking of number ones and number twos. <laughs> well, now I have to use the bathroom. There you go, right? We get the show started 20 minutes in. We're already talking about bathroom humor. And now Sean driving in from Apex is thinking, you know what? I kind of have to pull over on the side of the road, too. I drank too much coffee this morning. I have to go uh, a number one. Uh, speaking of number one, the number one overall draft pick in this year's class, Caleb Williams. Get ready for a uh, Get ready for the Panthers. Coming this weekend. Yeah, this could have did been. I, a number, did I set that up right? This is something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. This could have been number one versus number one, but we made a quarterback change in Carolina. So I didn't even think about that. Will it be Sweet Home Chicago for the Panthers, or will the Panthers just go back to the way things were? For Andy Dalton, this is an interesting pivot point for him. Journeyman quarterback going back home yet again, trying to get a winner over a team he has not beaten, in which most prognosticators suggest it will not happen the line right now is three and a half that's where the Panthers find themselves as road dogs against Chicago and the Panthers who are now two weeks removed from playing their best game of the season are facing a team that is just a Sunday away from playing its best game of the season the Bears were getting ready to riot in Chicago (laughs) the Blues brothers would have been playing hardcore if they hadn't pulled out a win against the Rams I'm a soul There you go. But the Bears played some pretty good football, and now they take on a Panthers team, which is trying to find, yet again, its identity, hitting the reset button and trying to move forward. And by all accounts, this will be a tall task. Again, based on the fact that it looks like the Bears are playing good football. Caleb Williams has figured things out. The bend-not-break Bears defense, I think that's the best way to call them, has been playing some pretty good football. And so while I think the number is a little bit low when it comes to over under at 41 and a half, perhaps the defenses will have something to say about that. Ejiro Evero, defensive coordinator of the Carolina Panthers, who we have not heard much from this season, and let's be honest, he has had very little to talk about. He's hoping for some uh, early down success against Caleb Williams. So much is made about third down and, uh, you know, um, making plays and get uh, making sacks and the f- fumbles and the interceptions and all that stuff, but like, to get yourself to those positions, you got to be better on early downs. And so, like, I actually have a higher value on first down because we need to – if we could get people to be um, – to, if we limit them on first down, we're going to be playing a lot of pass downs, and that's when those takeaway opportunities are going to present themselves. And so we got to be better on early downs. Um, we got to plan better. i got to do better. we got to play better, and uh, we all understand that. To see this Bears offense shine would be terrible. As, as, I mentioned, Panthers. as I mentioned yesterday, you don't want to set Caleb Williams up for his uh, rookie of the year contender game if you're the Carolina Panthers. And Coach Ever is exactly right. I mean, if you're able to keep this Panthers, or excuse me, this Bears offense behind the chains and you're forcing them to uh, second and long, third and long, and force them to pass the ball, it can create some, uh, some turnover opportunities for this Panthers secondary. Bears control the run. Bears can handle the secondary, and they're – going to force the Panthers into making Andy Dalton try to carve them up. I mean, I I don't know if that's possible. I don't know if that's possible for Andy Dalton to do. But the Bears played a hot garbage game against the Indianapolis Colts recently, too. And so these two teams are trying to find themselves and wade through the tall, deep water to emerge on the other side. But it feels like that momentum has shifted in a bit of a different way. So Carolina's got to focus a little bit more on defense without their veterans, without a Shaq Thompson this week, which is not good. With a hopefully recovered Shy Tuttle, which will give them some sort of hope in terms of depth on this team. Jadavion Clowney, the one guy who's trying to do it all right now, talks about playing against that former number one pick in Williams. Uh, I feel like as a, as a D-line, as a... As- it's a set for us to get to him. Is that that's the only thing I'm thinking is about get to him and try to make him calls. If you watch the games, if you get to him, get pressure on him, he do throw the ball all over the field, just throw it up for grabs. So uh, hopefully we can put some pressure on him, give us throws one, a few turnovers. Now, Interesting. Now, Graham, it's not. It's funny. It's not Caleb Williams that's getting all the press right now. It's Jaden Daniels. And as you talked about having that Caleb Williams breakout game, do you see Caleb Williams? 
as a light threat to the Panthers' defense, or is he the is he deserved of being this heaviest threat? Because the majority of time yesterday, talking with the media defensively and offensively, it was about praising Caleb Williams. I, I certainly don't want to say that Caleb Williams is a light threat for the Carolina Panthers. As we mentioned, there was a reason why he was drafted number one overall in uh, in his NFL class. But I do think that he has some good playmakers. One being, and I'm sorry, Carolina Panthers fans, for speaking his name into existence, is DJ Moore. Now, I'm not going to say that Kayla Williams may not be on the same uh, level as Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels, I think, is just head and shoulders above the rest of this NFL rookie quarterback class. But Kayla Williams certainly has that ability with his athleticism to uh, to improvise a little bit in the pocket, to continue plays and. He's done it a lot with his feet, and I, I remember his first preseason game where he was just running around in the pocket when it was collapsing all around him, and he was still able to get passes off uh, close enough for touchdowns. The whole reason for the drafting of Caleb Williams was because he played for USC and not uh, Alabama or Georgia, because he had to keep that USC Trojans team in games from time to time. And those feet and that athletic ability are what makes number 18, and that's the number that he wears, incredibly special. You look at the Chicago Bears team, and it's a fantasy footballer's dream, right? You looked up and down, and you're like, yep, I'll draft Keenan Allen. Not a problem. Come yep. over from the Chargers, leading receiver. Roma Dunze, speed breaker, top pick. Cole Kmet, if I need a tight end, that's where I'm going to go. And they pulled Gerald Everett from the Chargers as well. DJ Moore, who you mentioned. DeAndre Swift has had a weird year, though. He's had an unusual year at running back for the Chicago Bears to where it has to have – it has to come from Williams to get him uncorked because, again, I just said the Bears came off their best game of the season in which Swift had almost 100 yards rushing. But in the three games prior to that, wasn't even close to that total that he had in the fourth game. There's a there's a place to exploit the Chicago Bears is to control that running game and make Williams make some actual decisions with that football. But where's that pressure going to come from? I think that's that's the issue. The Golden Retriever, head coach Dave Canales, his thoughts on Caleb Williams. I know that with rookie quarterbacks, you know, you just try to feature the things they do well, you know, and I think they're working towards those things. Um, but, again, they're starting over conceptually, um, and I've been in that place twice now, you know, in Tampa and then here, you know, and it takes time to figure out your identity of what the offense is going to look like, get a focal point and all that, and they're working towards that. And they certainly have some skilled players and some talent around them. Is the scary number for this Carolina Panthers team the fact that Williams has had – decent efforts but in the big loss in a garbage loss against Indiana where he was forced to throw a ton and did manage to get sacked four times I mean he's going through Bryce Young syndrome right now I, he's been sacked 16 times in four games I feel like that Bears Colts game the most recent one was sort of an outliner for Caleb Williams performance just because those two teams like they were allergic to scoring in that game last week <laughs> well put well put but the Bears find themselves two and two and the Carolina Panthers find themselves at one and three. And that is a challenge for the Carolina Panthers. And there is a, a threat, a light threat, whatever it happens to be. The team that Andy Dalton is quarterbacking is a better team now, two weeks into his tenure as quarterback. But is this the night for for Andy Dalton? And it is and and there is no acceptability, right? We all want to win. We can't look to losses, especially the way the NFC South just shook up last night with Tampa and Atlanta, where Atlanta came out with a late-night victory. Y'all should have stayed up for that one. I did. I'm a little sleepy today for that one. But it evened things out in the NFC South to where, yeah, we're four games into the season going on number five, but for the Carolina Panthers, they can't afford to fall back any farther in yeah. this division. Yep, or else the, the Falcons or the uh, Buccaneers are just going to start trading trading first place back and forth, and the Panthers are going to be left in the dust behind uh New, with New Orleans. Does Vegas know something that we don't know, though, at this point? We where always they, like to say that. Where they've set the line at just three and a half. Where they feel like there's some sort of mojo that's happening with the Carolina Panthers that they don't deserve to be nine or ten point underdogs. Remember last season, that was just rough to look at. And then you stare at this team this right now. And then you go, do the Panthers stand a chance in this one? Which is where it's close. And so you think to yourself, what are we missing? What are we missing? Are we missing the fact that Deontay Johnson is trying to figure out what's going on with an ankle or a groin or whatever it is? 
are we underestimating the fact that Chuba Hubbard can not just run with the football, but also can catch a football as well? Missing Adam Thielen. Is that the bit? Don't know how much stock. I mean, I, I say this as far as somebody from the outside looking in because sure, I, no, that's the way you're supposed to be. We now. we've been we've been high on Xavier Leggett. Maybe there's some some questions about how much can he really take on as far as wide receiver number two right now for this Panthers offense. And then again. There's no question that the Panthers' defense right now is suffering from the injury bugs. I'm sure that has something to do with it. But also, going back to being a three and a half point underdog and not a 10 point underdog like we saw last season when the Panthers faced the Bears, you can't sit here and deny the fact that this Panthers offense and this Panthers team as a whole, despite the injuries on defense, is showing signs of improvement going back to the game against the Raiders and then the game last week. Um, who did they just put? I'm completely. <laughs> I've lost the my Bengals. memory here. The Bengals. There you go. So maybe it's about the Carolina Panthers collective as opposed to, as opposed to just individuals. All right, let's dig into the paw print. Let's get you our uh, biggest keys and ideas on how the Carolina Panthers can get a dub on the road. And I just mentioned collective when it came to the Carolina Panthers, and that's what it's going to have to happen on defense. With all these fill-ins, the, the fresh look at Trevin Wallace, J.C. Horn, Going to have to step up. Going to have to make some plays. And Jadavion Clowney is going to have to play out of his mind at this point. But it will be about the collective in terms of getting some pressure on Caleb Williams and forcing him into making actual decisions. Because when you look at the Chicago Bears team, at least from where I look at it offensively, there's no reason why this team shouldn't run people off fields. There's so much talent available to them. And when it clicks, it clicks. And the idea for the Carolina Panthers defense is to help them not click at all. And so it has to come from a combined team effort and not individual heroics. I can't believe I couldn't believe the Panthers just played the Bengals. Maybe I need to go to the doctor. Uh, Staying on (laughs) Mine's not about a memory. Sticking with uh, defense, I think you got to disrupt Caleb Williams and apply pressure on him early. As a rookie, Caleb Williams, I think, is still adjusting to the NFL's speed and complexity. The Panthers' defensive line, led by Jadavion Clowney, needs to generate consistent pressure to make Williams uncomfortable in the pocket, force, force him to make quick decisions, and limit his ability to extend plays with his legs. That's going to be crucial in slowing down this Bears offense. I think uh, Edra Ever has a huge task this week defensively as far as mixing up blitz packages and disguise coverages to keep Caleb Williams guessing. Deep look there. Panthers pop right here presented by the Carolina Ford dealers. My other thing goes back to offense, and it's about trust. It's about Andy Dalton and being a veteran quarterback and digging into his brain and thinking about all the times throughout his decade-long career in the NFL about who he had to trust in key moments. And we saw a couple of drops last week by Zay Leggett. That's the guy he has to trust. That's the guy that Brad Idzik's going to have to trust. That's the guy that Dave Canales is going to have to trust to help them step up and take that next leap. It only has to take one. I talked about defense as as a collective, but offensively, sometimes it needs a breakout performance. The Kansas City Chiefs saw it with Xavier Worthy in week one. I think for week five here, Zaley Gett is going to have to be the guy. Jet sweeps, quick routes, and one, one. Let's hit on one deep ball. Just one. And that's the guy that's going to get it for you. We talked about how the Bears rely on their run game to sort of open up their playbook, sort of like Dave Canales wants to do with his Carolina Panthers team. So I think you got to match their energy a little bit as far as establishing the run game. Uh, Panthers need to control the tempo by establishing the ground attack. Whether it's Miles Sanders or Chuba Hubbard, controlling the line of scrimmage will help take the pressure off and off Andy Dalton, open up play action opportunities, keeping Williams and the Bears' offense on the sidelines while wearing down this defense is critical, especially against a young Bears team looking to gain some momentum as the season continues. I want to say the Panthers get this one tomorrow, Graham. I mean, Sunday. I really do. Oh, I had that vibe last week against Cincinnati, and it just came up short. I had the vibe against the Raiders literally after the first snap, and I was like, they made it happen. Well, again, again, three-and-a-half-point dogs. Does Vegas know something we don't? Perhaps. Is, is, is it projected to be very windy this Sunday in Chicago? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe all the, uh, all the deep dish pizzas will weigh some of that offense down and see what happens.
Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 99.9 The Fan. The NC State Wolfpack and the Wake Forest Demon Deacons play for the 118th time tomorrow at noon inside Carter Finley Stadium. Our family network, Mix 101.5, has play-by-play coverage with pregame coverage beginning at 10 a.m. UNC has never lost to Pitt in Chapel Hill. The Tar Heels, who have won seven straight home games against Pitt, will try to make it eight in a row against the undefeated Panthers tomorrow at noon at Keenan Stadium. You can view that game on ESPN2. And Duke football is 5-0 for the first time in 30 years and one of 19 remaining undefeated FBS teams. The Blue Devils will try to keep that momentum rolling into Atlanta where they'll face Georgia Tech tomorrow night at 8 p.m. You can listen to play-by-play coverage on 99.9 FM HD2 or 620 AM Buzz Sports Radio with pregame coverage starting at 7. Find these stories and more on WRLSportsFan.com. Hey, just to let you know, if you are looking for a full day of sports tomorrow, maybe you got youth games in the morning, you're headed to State or, or Carolina at noon, you can also head out to the NC Courage tomorrow night. NC Courage are taking on San Diego, and they are going to sell a T-shirt, which will help out those in terms of Hurricane Helene relief. It's a Courage T-shirt called For the Love of North Carolina. It's actually a very nice T-shirt. And uh, you'll be able to buy those at the game, where game tickets are just $10. So 7 o'clock kick at a Wake Med Soccer Park. And you can support Hurricane Relief if you head out to the game again tomorrow night against the San Diego Wave for the love of North Carolina t-shirts. They'll have them at the match, and eventually, apparently, they'll have them online as well if you can't make it out there. Because, you know, life gets in the way. Life gets a little bit busy. Speaking of busy, college football slate is very busy this weekend. And tonight, tomorrow night, tonight is there's some college football, but tomorrow night, it's really about Duke and Georgia Tech. And surprisingly, Duke, and maybe this is just me saying it's a surprise, Duke's eight and a half point underdog. Yeah, I was very surprised when I saw I was very surprised when I looked up that line last night and saw that eight and a half. I mean, maybe there's something to be said about Georgia Tech's home field advantage. I mean, you went to some of the uh uh the Georgia to, or the Yellow Jackets home games during Spent your time, time in Atlanta. Yep. Um, and also, there's something to be said about Haynes Keen, Georgia Tech quarterback. Interesting stat. We are a month into college football being played, and he has still not been sat once. So, obviously, this Georgia Tech offensive line is the real deal. I know it was sort of in week zero when we saw them play against Florida State. You were kind of thinking, all right, well, you know, it's the first week of the new season. How good can they really be? Well, safe to say they've lived up to the test so far this year. Yeah, special team. There's no doubt about it. Now, are they special enough to get past a really red-hot Duke football team? Well, in terms of where Georgia Tech stands right now, they're coming off a tough loss at Louisville, so they're looking to right the ship pretty quickly. In terms of a night game at Bobby Dodd Stadium in the the heart of Atlanta, yeah, it'll be a nice, uh, rollicking place full of tradition, that's for sure. Head coach Manny Diaz spoke during the Adam Gold Show yesterday here on 99.9 The Fan, talked about uh, not having the letdown after getting that big win over Carolina. It's always going to be something that's there, you know, so what mm-hmm. you do is you, you watch all the signs. Um, I think there's just a physical toll. This, you know, they had a buy-in last week. This is our sixth game in six weeks. Um, but uh, what we've talked to our players about is that, you know, the standard's a standard, you know, and we didn't set out to go 5-0. and We didn't set out to just beat North Carolina. We have we have much bigger goals, um, and the standard doesn't really care what happened last week. And, and really what we drew, we drew the connection is, being five and zero is the same thing as being down twenty to zero. It's only a reflection of what's happened in the past. It, it does not have anything to do with what happens next, um, and that's a mistake that everybody makes. Just like everybody who might have thought the game was over when it was twenty to zero, um, or players who assume that we're in a place of comfort because we're five and zero. When the ball, you know, hits a foot on um, on Saturday night, we don't get first and five because we've won our first five games. It's going to be first down and ten, and um, and so it just it's, we have to go back to what wins a football game and start all the process all over again. I'd, I'd like a spicy Manny Diaz. I do. Like, full caliente. He, he could, you know, for those who are thinking that the game was over when we were down 20 points, and for those, you know, players who thought, you know, we were okay at 5-0, and I was like, dude, he's calling y'all out. Those who left at halftime, left the disco deck there in Durham, and missed the second half of that football game, 
Oh. The Duke football team's one game away from being bowl eligible. How crazy is that? And that was just their goal. Or you and I both said that was just the goal for Manny Diaz this season coming in and revamping this program. The flip side of that is Georgia Tech is 1-2 and two in conference. And with a third loss, I believe, in this college football playoff expanded area, three losses, you're out. Like Florida State's out of the running. We know that completely. They're just a dumpster fire. But Georgia Tech in conference because they played conference games already – they would be 1-3 and three with a loss to Duke at home. That pretty much shuts them down for real postseason conversations outside of you know the bowl season, right? Duke wants to be part of that conversation, the larger conversation, the bigger goals, the different whiteboard goals, which for the Blue Devils, good for them. Good for them. All right, UNC, here's a bit with a noon kick against Pitt. And we know the history behind Pitt, and again, those teams are different, right? It's not the same team that rolls in here that keeps losing year after year after year, but Pitt is favored going into Chapel Hill. And Mac Brown facing a lot of questions, and yesterday, um, when we were talking Carolina football, it was, you can tell that the fan base is a little... Uh, On edge. Yeah, the seat's not as comfortable, to right? To put it nicely. Yeah, the seat is not as comfortable. Head coach Mac Brown, Carolina Tar Heels, talking about snapping this losing streak they're on. Every game's important. We talk to our players uh, about, and we have to do this in life, you need to be where your feet are. You better worry about today. We don't even know if we've got I mean, We can be gone tomorrow. So we're about today. We're about getting better. We're about what you fix. And, and don't worry about what happens if somebody doesn't like something that you did. I mean, if, if we had beaten Duke, the ones that are mad would have still been mad over JMU. So I, I, you can't worry about all that. If you start, you better worry about yourself. And I'm responsible for a lot of people. I got to worry about them. I sure can't get overloaded enough to start worrying about everybody else. Uh, so guys in the room, uh, all focused on that, not worried about the outside noise. I don't know. I mean, he he's been around. He's seen a lot of things. I mean, he was at Texas. So if there's anybody who understands the 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 pressure in the boiler room, it's Mac Brown. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I mean, I get what he's saying as far as even if they beaten Duke, there's still going to be people that are upset about the James Madison game, vice versa. But I think the bigger picture that Matt Brown doesn't want to come out and say is that it's not that the fans are mad about those two games this season. They're mad about we're in year three of this Carolina team getting off to a uh, – 4-0 start, 6-0 start, 9-0 start, and then all of a sudden all it takes is them to stump their toe once, and then it's the whole world's falling on them. And for this Carolina team tomorrow, this defense, they have a big test in front of them. You want to talk about rebounding from the past two weeks? Well, try controlling this pit offense that is uh, high power. And by the way, Pat Narduzzi, not a big fan of North Carolina. So he is <laughs> not going to be afraid to go in there and roll up the score, run up the scoreboard. And just looking past Pitt, their next two games, Georgia Tech at home. Then you go on the road to Virginia. Anything can happen in that Virginia-Carolina game. So, North Carolina fans, buckle up. These next three, uh, these next three games are going to be what I like to call the uh, the witching days for this Tar Heel football team. We made so much about the Tar Heels not having to leave or go very far out of the state of North Carolina. We it did probably, not really help them at all. We probably should have focused more on just the play of the team. Jacoby Criswell is trying to will this team into into existence. And accuracy and and uh, command will help out. Omarion Hampton cannot do it all. He cannot do it all. And you don't want to get into a boat race with Pittsburgh just this season. This season specifically, y'all. You know, you know what a pit offense used to look like. It's a much different bit. All right, we do need to dip into State here because State is hosting Wake Forest. Wake Forest, right at the bottom of the ACC. Tough losses, blowout losses and whatnot. State favored by four in this one. Head coach Dave Dorn. Very well aware of what Wake Forest brings to the table. Yeah, you know, it's really hard to uh, duplicate what that looks like in practice with the scouts. I and mean, we've tried really hard, giving it a good shot. I mean, game day is going to be the tell. <clears throat> it's a unique offense, as we all know, and they've got good receivers, quarterbacks playing with confidence, uh, their running backs run hard. They're doing a good job on offense. I mean, that's not been their problem, you know, and they've had some tight, tight losses. One possession losses, and they are moving the football. They are possessing the football. They've got explosive plays, so it's always a challenge, you know. And you got to pressure the mesh point. And you got to mix it up, and you got to make plays on the ball, you know. And then you're gonna have to tackle in space. Wake Forest, just a weird team. Just a weird team. Their losses have been close losses in high-scoring games. 
and the true loss against Ole Miss where the, you know they did the buy it or whatever it happens to be, just set that one aside. Like It feels like if they're going to break out at some point, it would come against a state team led by C.J. Bailey, who's got now some real reps under his belt. And, boy, Tony Gibson's going to have his hands full with, with Wake. Oh, man, Dave Clawson's MO, the slow mesh offense that he lives and dies by when it comes to Wake Forest. This game comes down to which offense can get going first. And I know that sounds so cliche, but as Dave Dorn just mentioned, Wake Forest is not afraid to get into a shootout with teams. Now, granted, I mean, I don't think they want to rely on their defense winning, team, winning games, so no. that's more pressure on NC State to get the run game going. I also want to see C.J. Bailey uh, push the ball downfield. It feels like last week against Louisiana, or not, not Louisiana Tech, I'm getting my games all mixed up. Northern Illinois, it seemed like it was more uh, east to west than it was north to south. Yeah, well, that was control, too. I mean, you got to figure out what you got. No, I, under, I understand that, but I, I think you got to – not be afraid to take risk and throw the ball downfield. And you got to get concept- Casey Concepcion um, part of this offense again. Four receptions last week uh, for one touchdown is very that, – in- that's just a foreign language to NC State fans. So I think you got to rely on Concepcion to be a key playmaker this week along with the run game with Jordan <laughs> Waters. Game. Yeah, I know. Kendra, it's been it's been a struggle to watch, but in a game like this where you got two potent offenses, you, you got to – you got to run the game or run the football a little bit at least. Try. And you mentioned East West, North South running would would help this team out a ton. They just got to create some space. But that Wake Forest defense, if they're going to focus on anything, it's to force CJ Bailey into making those throws that he's not comfortable making. I'm not sure if he has uncomfortable throws to be honest. He just needs the confidence to make the throws. And his receivers just do what they need to do and catch every damn ball.